I know the nigger. The employer must have some sort of punishment. I don't care what it is. If you'll let me tie him down by the thumbs or keep him on bread and water, that will do. All I want is just to have it so that when I get the niggers onto my place and the work has begun, they can't sit down and look me square in the face and do nothing. The Mississippi planter to Freedmen's Bureau official. The language is what the language is. Let me find some way or give me some way that I can punish these people so they'll do the work that I need them to do. We can see in this quote how politics, labor, and free will are intertwined. Uh, these are the themes for this week, this week being um, beginning of the second week of lectures, although we're meeting on Friday. We'll be looking at the way politics and labor and free will are, are, are in the mix, as it were, throughout this particular era. We're moving this week from the very end of the Civil War, 1865, to about 1877 well, at least for this lecture, excuse me, a period known as Reconstruction. Now, when thinking about Reconstruction, the general attempt by the Union, or by the, by the United States to bring the Union back together, when we think about Reconstruction, it's really important to understand that we're talking about an evolving set of ideas, an evolving set of political strategies. Now, I'm simplifying things when I say it. There's no doubt about it. But there is a real element of improvisation during this era, an experimentation as the country at the federal level to the most local level is trying to figure out how to heal the wounds of division. I want to map out for you uh, the basic chronology of this era, and then we'll be, I'll be moving forward in this chronology and then working backwards again back to 1865. So in November of 1864, Lincoln's reelected. By April of 1865, he's assassinated. Before he dies, however, and after his reelection, he starts working on plans to complete emancipation. He had already made the proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, in 1863, but he was concerned that after the war, there might be attempts to see or to interpret the Emancipation Proclamation as merely a wartime resolution and not something permanent. And for Lincoln, the die has been cast now. He's got to find a way to make emancipation permanent. And so he starts working with Congress and other individuals for the passage of what would become the 13th Amendment for the Constitution, to the Constitution. The first of three so-called Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment, Amendment abolishes slavery. Again, making sure that eman the Emancipation Proclamation is more than just a wartime measure, that it would emancipate those people who are legally still kept as slaves after the Emancipation Proclamation. So looking directly at this slide, you're going to see Lincoln's assassinated in 1865. Excuse me. At the end of 1865, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery is passed. You enter into phase of presidential reconstruction, followed by radical reconstruction. Then you have the two other reconstruction amendments, the 14th, establishing the lines of citizenship and guaranteeing due process. The 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right, guaranteeing the right to vote that would not be um, mitigated based on your race or previous uh, servitude. And by 1877, withdrawal of northern troops into the Reconstruction. I wanted you to get this down in your notes so you understand the chronology that I'll be going back over for the rest of this particular lecture. So Lincoln's reelected. He's building a plan, advocating a plan that, that would turn into the 13th Amendment, calling for a complete end of slavery in the United States. Things aren't looking good for the South. It seems that the North is going to win the Civil War. 
even before Lincoln's assassinated, he seems pretty certain that's going to be the case. And so several central questions, now that the tide is turning this way, simply have to be addressed. And these are the questions that are really the, I'll be spending the lecture addressing. And the questions might seem kind of strange to you, but as you'll see, they're rather relevant to the ways in which whites and blacks are responding to this new era in U.S. history. What does one do with blacks now they've been emancipated? How will they be controlled? Use that language very intentionally. Who will do the work, and how will the South, South survive the upheaval? What I want to do, it, this is a, an incredibly complicated era, and I've always been struggling with the right way to tell this story. What I want to do for the rest of the lecture is tell the narrative mainly from a standpoint of high politics, electoral formal um, uh, processes in legislatures, for instance, and then I want to go back over the same time period looking at the social history, what's sort of happening on the ground. So I was giving you the heads up, we'll be looping back over going back to 1865 and starting over, in, uh, in a sense, looking at these different um, narratives to address these questions. What do you do with blacks? Who are they going to be controlled? Who will do the work? And will the South survive the upheaval? Now, before Lincoln is killed, he starts trying very aggressively to figure out the best way to reunite the country after the war. He proposes a 10 percent plan. This is it's called the 10 percent plan. And it is a, the elements of the plan involve a pardon to all Southerners, except for Confederate leaders. They could not be excused. A pardon would be given to all Southerners who took an oath of loyalty to the Union and supported emancipation. Once 10 percent of a state population, we're talking white males, once 10 percent of the state population agrees to this idea, signs this loyalty oath, a new government could be formed. Anti-slavery activists, <coughs> congressional radicals, people are just staunch supporters of the Union effort, saying this is way too lenient. We have spilt too much blood. Just to say, if 10 percent of the South goes along with this plan, everything will be forgiven. The plan goes nowhere. Lincoln is assassinated. Andrew Johnson takes office <coughs> and develops a plan and a series of measures that, taken together, are captured in what we call presidential reconstruction. The basic terms of presidential reconstruction say that a general pardon is given to the white South, <coughs> except for Confederate leaders, just like Lincoln's plan. But Johnson's is different. He says, we will pardon everyone except for Confederate leaders and wealthy planters. Johnson was a man of the people, coming from farming roots, working very hard, and saw that moneyed landowners, plantation owners, were a real source of, of many of the problems in the South. So the pardon to the white South, except for Confederate leaders and wealthy planters, it required the end of slavery. And then it would let the South set up its own governments. And the thinking was that the white yeoman farmers, since the white um, planters, the wealthy planters, would not be allowed um, to be the leaders, that white yeoman farmers, people working sort of hand to mouth and, and scraping by, they would be the one who would take control of these governments and restructured the society more along sort of, I would say, um, agrarian, class-sympathetic lines. Plan moves forward, and Johnson could not have been more wrong about what would happen. He thought that there would be a new egalitarian <laughs> ethos in the South, and what happened is that once the whites take over office, they begin to answer the set of questions I posed at the beginning of the class in terms of what to do with blacks. With, um, a rather curious set of answers. They enacted the so-called Black Codes. I'm going to skip over the Black Codes for the moment, say that for the social history part of the lecture, but they enact the Black Codes. The answer 
under Johnson that the white governments in the South provide does not look a whole bunch better than slavery for many African Americans. The Republicans in Congress, people who've been uh, staunch anti-slavery advocates, are horrified at Johnson's plan. Lincoln's was way too lenient, Johnson's was stricter, but it didn't change the social order as it turns out. And so Congress, the Republicans in Congress, they, they now control the Congress, sets about fighting Johnson at every turn. <coughs> Johnson has a plan, Congress overrules it. Johnson vetoes Congress's decision, Congress beats back the veto. I mean, the government is just locked in this battle at the federal level on all manner of issues. During this period of federal in, in inside battling, I suppose one could call it, Republican-controlled Congress pushes through the first Civil Rights Act in 1866. It pushes through the 14th Amendment, delineating the terms of citizenship and due process. Due process is something you'll be hearing of being incredibly important from freedom struggles as we move forward in this class. And threatened, the, the Congress threatened South's representation in Congress if blacks were denied the right to vote. Southern states, seeing the handwriting on the wall about the, the fact that the Republican controlled Congress, which is a Northern Congress, sees these terms and just rejects them. Congress gets tough and ushers in a series of reforms that become known as radical reconstruction or congressional reconstruction. They are the same thing, congressional reconstruction, <laughs> radical reconstruction, bless you. So Johnson has a, a chance to make a difference in Reconstruction from 1865 with Lincoln's assassination to 1867. That two years of experimentation, Congress says, forget about it. We're taking control here through sheer numbers and enters the longest phase of Reconstruction, Congressional Radical Reconstruction from 1867 to 1877. And it is a radical change. Under this new Reconstruction Plan, the South is divided into five military districts. These districts are controlled by Northern and Republican governments. It, there is quite literally a military occupation of the South by federal troops. Congress pushes through the 15th Amendment in 1870. guaranteeing blacks, and this is black males, please understand, guaranteeing, guaranteeing them the right to vote. If you've been a slave, doesn't matter. If you're black, doesn't matter. You have the right to vote. After this amendment passes, you start seeing a period in the, in, in the eras of different reconstructions of incredible positive change for many African Americans. Not all, but many. And that change often comes through, the num you can mark it by the dramatic increase, well, increase it from zero, anything is dramatic, I suppose, but the dramatic increase of blacks holding office. You start seeing black men holding office at the local level, being elected to maybe a town council, let's say, some places being elected the local sheriff, which is really quite astonishing, through state governments and into the federal government, in Congress and in the, uh, in the House of um, Representatives and in the Senate. The change in representation, that there are blacks in government at all levels, is astonishing on many levels. What is even more astonishing, and I'll repeat this fact in about 10 weeks or 11 weeks, is that the number of black elected officials in the federal government, House of Representatives and Senate, blossoms during this era, at the end of Reconstruction, which I'll start talking about in the next lecture, that those numbers start to evaporate, 
and the numbers do not return as far as federal representation of blacks coming from the southern states, does not return until Bl Bill Clinton's elected president. This is a radical change, and it is so radical it could not be sustained, as we'll see. But for the moment in 1870 through 1877, at the, at the level of politics, electoral politics, it seems there is a real opportunity for change as far as representation at the local, the state, and the federal level. All of these changes, federal occupation, uh, military occupation of the South, setting very aggressive terms about how the South, Southern government, governments could um, be reformed and readmitted to the Union, having blacks hold elected office, all of these changes tear at the social fabric of the South. What I want to do for the next bit is to start looking at these changes sort of on the ground, trying to help us understand the ways in which things had shifted fundamentally for whites and African Americans at the moment of the end of the Civil War. Now, as I alluded earlier to the question, what are you going to do with blacks? The central question of the era is what, what one does with blacks springs out of the fact that freedom meant different things to different people. Freedom meant liberation for blacks, and that, that part is obvious, certainly. For whites, at that moment of liberation, those who had slaves from small, you know, small slaveholding households, two or three slaves to plantations, it means an immediate loss of labor. For blacks and whites, it means a, an immediate sense of profound instability in the social fabric. In a very curious way, it means for blacks a more dangerous situation, dangerous moment. Slaves' bodies <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Slaves' bodies had value, I'm literal value. You were property. If you did something, if someone thinks you did something wrong, black person and offends a white person's sensibilities, and the white person decides to um, strike me, hit me, hurt my body, or something. That white person has damaged property that belongs to somebody else, and they had to make restitution. After the end of the Civil War, black bodies were, from a, fin from a financial standpoint, they had no value. Now, I remember actually making this statement during a, a public lecture at a, at a library during a series of lectures in San Diego, and someone got very upset with me. Everybody has value. I mean, yes, everybody does have value. I'm talking a literal dollars and cents. Black bodies don't have value after, after the moment of the end of slavery, and you can do what you want to with them. Freedom, you can't discount. It's important for African Americans, the moment of li liberation. But profound instability you can't ignore either. Now, since the Southern economy is devastated after the war, during the war and after the war, since there's a loss of labor that is profound, white planters want a quick return to plantation labor. You've got to get crops in from the field. And they understood that we, can't, we don't own slaves anymore, but there's got to be a way to get gang labor reorganized, have an overseer. At the same time, black, uh, white planters want this, blacks who have been working on these plantations, for example, they've got to find a way to put food on their table, but they want to have economic autonomy via land ownership. They want to have their own farms. White farm owners want blacks to sign labor contracts to commit themselves to work on the farms. Blacks reject this, saying they expect the federal government to help them out. They expect the federal government to redistribute land. So you have these really intense conflicting expectations that are directly related to conflicting senses of what freedom meant. And if you look at 
some of these items on the screen here, I'll start talking about them. You'll start seeing where these expectations come from and why they would be so conflicted and complicated. Now, we're back in 1865. Johnson's the president. He wants to see the southern, southern economy back on track and wants blacks back to work immediately. The question is how to do it. He allows southern governments to reestablish themselves under presidential reconstruction guidelines. And once they do, a lot of these white governments start answering the question what to do with blacks and establish black codes. Now, black codes were a series of state-level laws aimed at answering the question what to do with this newly freed population. There was one, there wasn't a single set of black codes. They range broadly. Some are, are um, more strict than others, but they're just taking together a series of legal concepts that are seeking to create a new labor system that essentially put blacks back to work. Now, you look at the codes, you'll see they authorize blacks to acquire property, something blacks certainly wanted. It authorized blacks to marry, something they were not allowed to do when they were slaves. It authorized blacks to make contracts, sue and be sued, testify in court against other blacks, mind you. All of these things are essentially brand new. So the black codes, on the surface, at first glance, seem to be a way of trying to give blacks some citizenship rights they didn't have before. But you look a little more closely, you'll also see many other guidelines that make it clear that the black codes are about labor stabilization. And I'm lumping all these things together here. Some state codes required all blacks to have an annual proof of one-year labor contracts. Basically, you had to sign up saying, I'm going to work this plot of land at this plantation. I'm going to work in this shop for the next year, and I won't leave. If you leave the job, you sign that contract, you leave the job before the year is up, you will lose all wages that you had earned up to that point. And you might be subject to, an, to arrest by a white citizen. Now notice, I'm not talking about the white chief of police or deputy. Be arrested by a white person walking down the street who says, you know, you're not working the way you should be working. You clearly should be on that labor contract, and you, what are you doing here? Some st um, black codes would say that blacks couldn't steal labor or else they risked a $500 fine. And then, I mean, a ridiculous amount of money. Now, stealing labor, that could be interpreted as not working hard enough. Or that could be in interpreted as when you're working this plot of land, saving a little bit of that part for yourself. Not maximizing the return on the investment, essentially, <coughs> that white property owners had made. If you steal labor, you could be fined $500. In other states, blacks were forbidden to rent land in urban areas. The notion is, if you have them closer to a city, you might have critical masses developing, African Americans or property owners, or at least renters. They might be able to develop their own economic opportunities through informal networks. Essentially, allowing blacks to rent property in towns gave them too much autonomy, the fear was. Black codes forced black women back on farms. This way they would not be seen in public spaces. This is all for the good of the woman. This is for the black woman. They should really be in their natural habitat. This would have been the language of the day, by the way. Black codes regulated sexual behavior. You could not dress a certain way. You could, be not, you could not be out at a certain hour. Black codes would address vagrancy, idleness, rude gestures, mischief, preaching the gospel without a license, and so on. I mean, incredibly vague. If you're just kind of hanging out, you could be in violation of a black code. If you're up to no good, being mischievous, violation of a black code. And all of these could lead to fines or involuntary plantation labor. 
black coats forced apprenticeships on black miners, black young people, not miners, minors. Um, they would have to work without wages, it's mainly orphans or children of poor parents. Many of the black coats said that they could, blacks could not hunt or own weapons. But this is a very important limitation because in the rural south, you shot your food. But the idea was we start giving blacks guns. They may not shoot food, they may shoot us. So blacks can't hunt their own weapons. So you take all these things together, and again I've lumped many different states' black codes here. It's clear that while everyone wants the southern economy back on track, I mean everybody does, there's no rational way of justifying doing it via the black codes. And so fairly soon after they're being established, sometimes in less than a year, these black codes are declared illegal and are eliminated. So we're talking about a very a brief moment in time. This sort of underscores the notion of we're at a period of improvisation and experimentation. We'll try this until we're told it doesn't work any longer. In the place of the black codes, a new labor system develops. This one was much more focused, much more explicitly focused upon labor instead of all the morality issues that you see in the black codes. And this new labor system that becomes incredibly successful for what it was is called sharecropping. Sharecropping re revolves around credit. The whites own the land, the tools, the seed, but they didn't own the labor. That's what blacks controlled. So blacks could use the land, the tools, and the seed, but they did not get paid in cash. Instead, they would rent the whites' property and their tools, etc. In order to get the seed, they'd have to go to the company store for their purchases. And the store would be sort of like Durfee's, you know, exorbitantly priced. So, um, you know, if a bag of seed on the market I'm making up the numbers here, might have cost one dollar. At the company store, maybe it's three, three credits, three units, or something like that. So sharecroppers would pay for their food, their seed, et cetera, with their shares, their portions of the crop that they were growing and later harvesting for the landowner. At the end of the year, when the crop in question, let's just say it's cotton, which it would have been for a tremendous amount of this system, when the cotton is taken to market, the cotton that black sharecroppers had planted and harvested, they would not be able to go to market with the cotton crop. The landowner would go there, or his business manager, and he'd sell the cotton at the market rate, and he would come back and make a declaration of how much he was able to get for this settle the accounts privately with the landowner, and the landowner and labor then settled their accounts. And then a funny thing happened. Almost inevitably, at the end of the year, at the, after the, the, the planting cycle, when the crop came, was sent to market and they came back with the money for it, they looked at the, the balances, and blacks owed money to the sharecropper every year. Let's just say, again making up numbers, that if I'm a sharecropper and I spend thousand dollars at the company store to buy all the, rent the equipment or buy the seeds or whatnot for my plot of land, I get this amazing crop, it goes off to market, come back and the guy said, you know what, I was only able to get nine hundred dollars. I now owe a hundred dollars to the landowner. <coughs> what this meant was, I'm stuck, because it is illegal to skip out on your debts. So the sharecroppers were required to go back to work for the same person in an attempt to eliminate the debt. So you have another, and the cycle just keeps repeating itself. You never get out of debt. You're always working the land. What this meant is that, you know, you, you, maybe you aren't being whipped by an overseer, but you are in perpetual servitude <coughs> as far as your labor and debt is concerned to the landowner. You can't escape it. Sharecropping works like a charm. It really begins in earnest in mid-1860s, or the later 1860s. It is still popular in the South through the 1940s. 
only with systematic mechanization of farms do you have sharecroppers being relieved of that particular economic cycle. So White attempts to answer the question of what, could one, what one could do to get blacks back to work revolved around various attempts, whether it's through the black goes or the sharecropping system, they revolved around various attempts to get to, to recreate slavery, but with a different name and a slightly different nature. I mentioned before, black, I mean, no, thinking about freedom from black's perspective also meant labor instability. This is why the black codes are so draconian. This is why there's such emphasis on you can't escape debt. This is a way to control blacks. Now remember, blacks had expectations too after the Civil War is over. They wanted their freedom. They got their freedom in a literal sense. There's no doubt about that. But there are also expectations about land ownership, that they would have land they could work themselves. And there are expectations the federal government would be the entity to help blacks navigate their, their, their um, arrival to full citizenship rights and property ownership. And these expectations grow out of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands and out of Field Order 15. The Bureau is established, the field orders enunciated, Black Codes enacted all at the same moment. So these are overlapping narratives. Expectations about land, access to it, grows from Union General Sherman's seemingly apocalyptic, apocalyptic march to the sea during which he burned his way through and across the South. And while doing so issued the famous Field Order 15, which declared that in part in, in that declared in part that coastal land between Charleston, South Carolina and Jacksonville, Florida was from this point on for, for blacks. If Congress had accepted this promise or acted upon this promise, excuse me, it would have given over land to roughly about 200,000 African Americans. The field order declared in 1865 doesn't redistribute land but there is the expectation that the government is going to do so through the likes of violence, perhaps, with General Sherman, or through an orderly attempt at giving assistance, and that's through the Bureau of Freed Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, more often known as the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was established in March 1865. It takes a while to get itself up and running. It's organized under the general, uh, Union General Otis O. Howard. That's why Howard University is named after this man. He gave his land to the university. The Freedmen's Bureau had the task of providing food, shelter, and medical aid for the destitute. That's blacks as well as whites. It had the duty of providing education for freed people To say that there was an educational system for blacks is ludicrous up to this moment in time. It's also kind of ludicrous after the fact, but they're working on it. The Freedmen's Bureau establishes free labor arrangements in former plantation areas. It's essentially trying, it's charged with trying to help blacks um, develop a, uh, an economic system where they could sign to do work and contract, but they had freedom in doing so. And the Freedmen's Bureau is charged with securing justice for blacks in legal proceedings. The Freedmen's Bureau record on this front is mixed at best. We know from Field Order 15 that the potential of returning or giving all this land to blacks doesn't really happen. Freedmen's Bureau, they're talking about, you know, famous uh, 40 acres and a mule ideology. The Freedmen's Bureau is in control of, at one point, 850,000 acres of property that instead of being transferred to poor whites and to blacks, is transferred back to the original property owners. So these white planters lost their land in the war, and after some sorting out, they got their land right back. The notion of establishing wage labor contracts that blacks are not going to be working for a year like in the sharecropping system that would have developed, 
but they would, get, get, they would be paid wages, doesn't work. So the Freedmen's Bureau doesn't distribute land like it promised it would, it fails in establishing wage labor contracts. But it does do something really remarkable in that it starts establishing schools. Now again, these schools would not be on par with white schools, not by long shot. But again, when you start from zero, any change is a radical change. So from 1865, the moment of its founding, to 1869, 3,000 new schools for blacks, these are shacks essentially, are established. So the Freedmen's Bureau seems to, at least on one level, be doing something right, making a real change. But by 1872, it's gone as well. It collapses. So it leaves, with, it leaves us with a mixed record. The record of radical reconstruction, in fact, for much of the 1870s is, is mixed. The North is growing increasingly weary of Southern intransigence, incredible resistance to these kinds of changes. Southerners are tired of the Northern presence and were angry at having new state constitutions written under Republican-controlled governments that, as far as white Southerns were concerned, gave away way too much in terms of the rights of citizenship to black men. This period of sorting out, of radical changes at the electoral level that are highly positive for African Americans, there's no debating that, that are of mixed success on the ground for the great majority of African Americans, but clearly it's better to be free than slave, despite all the dangers that are incumbent with it. It is a period of, of, of incredible stress and resentment and of different ways in which whites try to assert control. What are we going to do with these blacks? Who's going to control them? One of the first answers was the establishment of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, established in Tennessee in 1866. You didn't need the Klan prior to emancipation, but as far as many whites were concerned, you needed something like the Klan after. Klan members would go after uh, white Northerners who are holding elected office, would threaten them with assassination and assassinate some of them, would go, go after you know, Jews and Catholics, and certainly went after blacks as well. Klan forms in 1866, but remember, this is a period of military presence from the North and the South, and under General Grant, the Klan is wiped out within two years for a while. But even though the Klan is wiped out, you can see through this era, 1865 to 1877, rising tides of resentment, chafing by white Southerners, rising tides of, of um, I guess one might just say impatience by black Americans, saying when are we going to have a real change? And real change did come, but not in the way that African Americans had hoped. In 1876, this presidential election, the two men left standing are Samuel Tilden, a Democrat, and Ruther Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican. Tilden wins the popular vote, but, not, but the electoral vote was unclear because the results from the southern states were so contested. Sounds like recent history, in fact. A compromise, though, was reached that Hayes, the Republican, would secure the presidency but only if he promised to withdraw federal troops from the North, uh, excuse me, from the South, in the military occupation, let the Southern states all come back into the Union. Hayes accepts the deal. The North again was exhausted by all this struggle. And with this famous compromise of 1877, Reconstruction ends. Now at the end of Reconstruction, we get a new period of American life, generally referred to as redemption. When the white South shall rise again, they will redeem themselves. And I'll be talking about redemption in the next lecture, but I want to turn now from a moment of high politics or a discussion of high politics 
and a discussion of social history, sort of life on the ground, to take a moment to look at some other types of, some, some primary sources that helps us understand what I'll just call the political culture of the moment. Very famous image, what miscegenation is, what we are to expect now that Mr. Lincoln is reelected, talking 1864 now. I mentioned in the first lecture, you know, uh, nation states declaring their cultures and the ideologies and their myths on their currency. Well, you can see it as well in political posters, certainly, political cartoons. And this is a represents the kind of theme we're going to see a fair amount in this course. Just like the currency, exalted white womanhood, and in this case, uh, a caricature, very dark-skinned caricature of an African-American man. Caricature as being of black males, as you probably already know, will certainly know more, um, very live and well during this period, and certainly even to today in different ways, something we'll talk about later on in the course. But a broadside talking about this is what we're going to expect now that Lincoln's been reelected, all hope's been lost. White women and black men will connect in this sort of way. Now this one I think is interesting because often the notion is that black men are assaulting white women, but in this case you have a, the, her arm is wrapped around not in seeming protest. Be that as it may, the notion of black and white mingling in this sort of way was a profound threat. This is 1864. Now, I talked to the Freedmen's Bureau and the, and the work that it was assigned to do is there to establish wage labor contracts and try to help navigate land redistribution, it seemed at first, and try to help provide basic assistance and education to African Americans. Well, in the political campaigns in 1866, after the Freedmen's Bureau has been established, you start seeing representations, again, another very famous poster, representations of what Reconstruction actually means. The Freedmen's Bureau, or what, excuse me, the Freedmen's Bureau means. The Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man, twice vetoed by the President and made a law by Congress. Support Congress and you support the Negro. Sustain the President and you protect the white man. Another caricature of an African American in tatters, because it doesn't really need to be dressed well, doesn't really care. Barefoot, idle, happy as can be. A white man looking on, working very hard, trying to earn his keep, do the right thing. Now, Aside from this being a very famous poster, sort of capturing the sentiment and re or resentment about the Freedmen's Bureau being there to assist the lazy African American, this is also important to, to highlight the ways in which these narratives appear in surprising places and ways, or at least ways that we m today might think are surprising. This is a campaign ad, not in Alabama, not in Mississippi, but in Pennsylvania. It's an ad or sort of regarding an election, election in 1866, pitting John Geary, Republican, against uh, Heister Clymer um, for the governorship of Pennsylvania. Clymer saying, the Democrat, saying, if you support Geary, you're supporting this. black idleness. From the same campaign, I mean, this is dramatic, I think pretty dramatic as well, but you see the notion of caricature and ideals of white beauty, but in a different sort of way, in the same campaign, another broadside. Pretty direct here, Clymer's platform is for the white man. Geary's platform is for the Negro. Read the platforms. Again, if you're supporting Geary, represented here, 
by the grotesque representation of uh, a black male. If you're representing gear, you're representing all of those things that are wrong about excess, idleness, illiteracy, sexual aggression, all these things that are associated with black male, especially in this case, black male behavior. If you support a climber, you support someone who's educated, who's refined, who's disciplined. So we go from this image, which is a sort of a grotesquerie, very busy, lots of, lots of different text and, and representations, to this one that's cleaner, as it were, more upfront about its representations, to an 1868, these are, these are typical, these are not exceptional advertisements. In 1868, in the presidential, Democratic presidential primary, New York Governor Horatio Seymour, who was the governor of the state during the New York City draft riots and who um, did not pursue the draft rioters, the Irish who, who burned parts of the city and attacked and killed people and attacked the military, he didn't punish them, which, and he's a Republican now, and people thought that he was a traitor to the Union Army, or to the Union, and supporter of the Confederacy. Um, Anyway, New York Governor Horatio, Horatio Seymour is running with Francis Blair from Missouri for the Democratic nomination, and they announce their ticket. It couldn't be more simple. Our motto, this is a white man's country, let white men rule. So you see a range of images here that have been popularly distributed. distributed. Pennsylvania race for governor, presidential primary, again a northern governor, uh, in this case rep represented on the presidential part of the ticket. A language, a visual language, and sometimes just flat out words, of course, making it clear that this era of transition is not an easy one, that there's intransigence in all different corners, in all different regions from different perspectives. And if you're thinking I'm over-reading these things, let me just show this last image that sends a message to Northerners who are coming down to save the South, take over the South, occupy the South. Carpetbaggers, people who would load up their things in a bag from the North, come down to the South and set up a government, set up a business to take advantage of Southern resources. Certainly a lot of them did. The South had an answer for these people. And you would see posters up on, you know, plastered onto a tree or a wall that would simply say this. This is the nature of the sort of visual conversation, if you will, of this moment in time. A period of tremendous sorting out, a period, it seems, of incredible possibility and hope as far as, far as the elected realm is concerned for African Americans, a period much more complicated on the ground for African Americans and for poor whites, certainly a period of growing, growing or sustaining intransigence by white elected officials in the South, and a period where white elected officials in the North aren't quite certain about this whole period, this whole idea of trying to reconstruct the Union along these terms. The answers that I posed at the beginning of the class were answered, the questions I posed at the beginning of the class were answered through these narratives, and we'll see some more answers when we resume class. Um, the next session to talk about redemption. Thank you.